that's part of the reason why people become afraid of their food because they are terrified of oxalates and they are terrified of phytic acid and they are terrified of you know lectin and histamine and glyphosate and whatever else and it's not to say that they shouldn't be because in some cases those things hit the mark but you got to ask yourself when are, if you're sitting out there right now and you're a little bit afraid of your food you have no idea what to eat and you're struggling be careful about who you let in your ear welcome to the gene food podcast i'm your host john o'connor Hey everybody, today we have another solo episode. I'm gonna run through a couple of thoughts I have on the fear of food just in time for Halloween. And although this is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek introduction, it's a very serious issue for many of us. I am gonna detail in today's episode my journey on identifying food sensitivities that turned out to be real that I try to stick to and then food sensitivities that for me were either transient or didn't exist. And I know that in today's conversations around nutrition, um, the carnivore diet is a big one, uh, paleo diet, paleo, there's a lot of different protocols out there, vegan diets. And most of these protocols, I mean, even the Bulletproof diet, most of these, uh, Dr. Gundry, the plant paradox diet, a lot of these diets, um, are helpful for a lot of people, are well thought out, are uh, written by subject matter experts, but they do, uh, when they're implemented out there in the public, what I've noticed talking to a lot of people, we've you know, done thousands of nutrition plans and um, what I've noticed is that sometimes people will start to get really terrified of food because they're not feeling well and so they cut out every lectin or they cut out you know, all plants or whatever the case. And I want to share my story in today's episode about um, some of the other factors besides food that have played a role in how I feel and uh, my health journey and, um, and kind of maybe give some people out there the wiggle room to say, hey, maybe some of the foods I'm avoiding, I need to avoid. And maybe there's some foods out there that I don't need to avoid. Or maybe there are some foods out there that I used to be terrified of, but now because of a change in my microbiome or a change in my location or a change in my health, I don't have to be quite as strict on anymore. Um, we don't want people fearing the fridge. We want people out there being able to eat and enjoy food. And, um, and that's part of a healthy dietary protocol as well. So without further ado, here is my sole episode discussing the fear of food nutrition influencers, a little bit of Nietzsche. Hope you enjoy. Hey everyone, today we have a special Halloween edition of the Gene Food Podcast. We're going to talk about the fear of food. And this is something that is near and dear to my heart because I have been in situations before where I have been literally afraid of eating a morsel of food, worrying that if I eat a bean or if I eat an egg or if I take the wrong supplement or, you know, on and on it goes, that it's going to cause a degranulation of mast cells or I, you know, I'm going to have some terrible digestive issue or it's going to shorten my life or whatever the case. And I think that's a journey that a lot of us get on when we become motivated to achieve our highest state of health or really for many of us when we find conclusively that we've, that we've gone out of balance. And you know, I've been pretty open about my story on this on this uh, podcast and on and on our website discussing how and why I created Gene Food. And like a lot of people that have gotten into this space, I created Gene Food because I noticed that there were things wrong with my health that were not easily recognizable or easily diagnosed by the medical establishment. Now, when I say the medical establishment in that way, it's not intended as a disparagement of the medical establishment. I think that allopathic medicine and all that it has to offer is very valuable in a number of different contexts. And if I were to suffer some, God forbid, some kind of acute or really serious illness, I, I, I certainly wouldn't turn my back on or, or fail to seek the help of qualified medical professionals. I have a tremendous respect for uh, physicians and uh, nurse practitioners and, and all of the people in that community and all the work that they do. However, I do think that there is a degree of hubris out there in our uh, world right now on many fronts, and, and one of which is on the scientific front. And we, we kind of always assume that we're at the tip of the spear, that, that what we know right now is, is, is the 
most cutting edge, the most groundbreaking, that we have a lot of the answers and that if we just use the system that we have, that we could answer a lot of questions for people or, or unfortunately dismiss issues that people might be having and, and, and tell them, well, you know, there's no proof for that. There's no quote, the science doesn't recognize that. Or, you know, we, we, we couldn't, we couldn't conclusively diagnose you or, um, or, or validate the way that you're feeling. And for those of us who get on the wrong side of our health and start to get sort of nagging, you know, anxiety issues or digestive issues or fatigue or, or low mood or any of the different types of things that can kind of manifest when you start getting out of balance like this, whether it's Lyme, whether it's mold, whether it's histamine, whatever the case, there's a real collision point here because you, you, you don't want to be on the side of quackery. You don't want to be on the side of overselling something that you don't know about. You don't want to be, uh, pushing people into the fear of mechanisms that, you know, that you may have some conversational mastery of, but that have no application to them and their bodies. Um, and I see a lot of that in the health and wellness space these days. You know, I made a analogy on a previous podcast when Aaron and I were talking about the, uh, the game changers debate between, um, James Wilkes and, and Joe Rogan, I believe it was one of those episodes. And we talked about this fort, in northern Michigan that I actually visited with my family this summer. It's on Mackinac Island. Mackinac Island is a uh, island in the Mackinac Straits, which is uh, Lake Michigan, uh, northern Michigan area. Beautiful island. You have to take a boat to get there. And there's a colonial fort. It was occupied by the Americans and by the British, you know, hundreds of years ago. They built this fort, fort on a hill. And it's called Fort Michilimackinac. And there are cannons that are trained from Fort Michilimackinac onto the Straits of Mackinac. And they were, they were put there as a defensive posture for wars of, you know, the War of 1812, I believe, in some of these colonial wars and trading disputes and, um, and colonial disputes back in the, uh, in the 1800s and I believe as far back as the 1700s. Um, but the, the point of bringing up Fort Michilimackinac is you could tell somebody, well, look, there's guns trained on those. I mean, those cannons are still trained on the fort and some of the staff that, that dress up as period characters from the era to try to, you know, bring, uh, bring alive that, 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 uh, history for for kids and tourists that come along they they do actively keep some of those cannons working and they will make noise and you could tell somebody look well it's not safe to take those boats across the straits of, of Mackinac because there are guns that are trained on those waters well that's how I feel about a lot of the conversations and sort of the the, the dark side of the conversations about people getting on the wrong side of their health is we 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 can come up with a theoretical explanation for why somebody may be feeling poorly um, about why a certain food, you know, eating a lectin may cause a stress on the body or cause some degree of inflammation. What we don't know is whether it's substantive. What we don't know is whether the mechanism that we describe, we could see it described in an academic paper. We could master that academic paper. We could have the theory of why that mechanism could be damaging to somebody. But then what we have now in today's world, which is what I want to be steer very clear of, is overselling these mechanisms as if they're dispositive of every situation. You know, um, lectins is a great one, uh, is a great example. I believe in, in lectin sensitivity 100%. You don't need to, you know, you don't need to believe in it. There's science on it. I mean, celiac disease is essentially lectin sensitivity. It's, it's an autoimmune reaction to the proteins that are in wheat. And we have tissue transglutaminase antibody uh, tests that we can run, both IgA, which I, th I, I believe would be evidence of celiac, or we have IgG, which can be evidence of like a low burning smoldering gluten sensitivity. I mean, there's ways you can tease out in lab tests to determine that somebody has a lectin sensitivity to gluten. And you can, you can, uh, you can look genetically and you can see people that have lactose intolerance, you know, an enzymatic deficiency that, that stops them from being able to properly digest dairy and also ones that we can't pinpoint on. I mean, I, there's clearly people that are very sensitive to nightshades. There's clearly people that are, can't eat kidney beans. I mean, there's food sensitivities are real. The IgG tests that we use to, to identify them are probably very commonly giving off false positives, but I do think that the food sensitivity uh, issue is clearly real and people are experiencing it. The question is to what extent? The question is, when do we oversell it? The question is, when do we, as a community, uh, lose credibility when we, when we ha tell people that they need to be afraid of 
every single bean or every single plant species that they can't eat any of them, right? And when you're feeling sick and you're not feeling well, as I have, and I'm going to get into a minute here in the story of kind of, you know, some, some of how, what that looked like for me, you really do tend to lurch back and forth between these different mechanisms. And you say, okay, because you want to know why you're not feeling well. You want to know why you feel off. You want to know why your body's not, not working like it's supposed to. You want to know why you're having to worry all the time about, you know, what you're eating and, and why you're waking up not feeling well and why you know that, you know, your mood isn't where it's supposed to be. And it, 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 when, when people start overselling the mechanisms instead of empowering people to try to find out which mechanisms are firing to the extent we even can know which mechanisms are firing. I mean, T. Colin Campbell, say what you will about vegan diets. I'm not a vegan. Um, and I don't think that vegan diets are healthy for all people, but T. Colin Campbell s said in doing his work, which was extensive work. I mean, you, you, you may poo poo a nutritional epidemiology, but T. Colin Campbell did beautiful, extensive, serious professional work in this field. And he's somebody that should be respected and listened to, um, maybe not as the final, final voice, but certainly as a voice. And he, he said in one of these plant-based propaganda films that um, he realized at some point that what he was looking at was not the mechanism, but a concert of mechanisms. And so if you're somebody at home right now who is afraid of your food and, you know, I've been there, and you're just terrified of eating a plant and you're, or you're terrified of eating, you know, a piece of meat or whatever the case may be. I think sometimes understanding the mechanism is valuable. And I think understanding the mechanism is valuable to the extent the mechanism, mechanism has been fleshed out to a large degree by science. Understanding the mechanism in celiac is pretty valuable. You know, you have wheat, you have an autoimmune reaction, you have the degrad, the, the you know, the, the slow breaking down of the, of the small intestine and you have real illness that results from that process. I think the mechanism there is, is useful. I think the mechanism for lactose intolerance is useful. I think to a certain extent, the mechanism for histamine is useful. But man, I'll tell you what, when we're left out on our own because the medical community does not recognize these mechanisms yet, and it's not because they don't exist, it's just because we don't have the research. They haven't been studied. We don't, we don't, have, the, we don't have good enough diagnostic tools we don't have good, good enough diagnostic tools for, this, for the ever-shifting state of the microbiome. I mean, people are going and getting their LDL cholesterol tested, what, once a year? You know? And, and, and I mean, in the future, there's probably a movement where you're getting your microbiome tested weekly, daily. Who knows, right? I mean, you could have uh, toilets that are, that, are, uh, that are giving you real-time information about the state of your microbiome, which is giving you insight into why you can't digest X or Y food or why, you know, you have some sort of uh, immune system problem or whatever the case. We don't have that right now. We have major holes in the diagnostic setting. And there's not, an, it, there's not the corresponding humility that goes with that, with, with that, with the, the, with that, with those holes. And, 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 and those holes are not filled with mystery and calls for more research as often as they are filled with uh, debunkings and refutations of people's theories. But what I'm getting at is, is because there are these diagnostic holes that are out there, it's a major burden on those of us who aren't feeling well to try to have to constantly be hunting down the mechanisms and constantly be saying, okay, now I got it. Like, you know, it's just that, uh, you know, histamine is converting in the body into glutamate. Um, histamine is a wakefulness neurotransmitter. You know, my, my, my ma I, have, I have this extensive mast cell degranulation. The mast cells are producing more histamine, more inflammatory cytokines. Downstream of that is more glutamate, you know, and, and that's the physiological state of my body. And that's why I'm not feeling, you know, in, as, as well as I could. And and then you've come to this Sherlock Holmes moment. You tell your family, you tell your friends about it until you do more research the next week. And then you realize that, you know, you, you were either wrong or you, you came to a different conclusion. And, and so I think the, the, the hunt for the mechanism when you're afraid of these things um, is dangerous because I think that it's fraught with peril. I think it's fraught with the potential for error. And I think trusting in obscure mechanisms from the blogosphere and look, I love the blogosphere. I think the nutritional blogosphere is, is super valuable. I think that right now, Google search, for those people who aren't familiar, there's a lot of in the news about Google search and antitrust and these types of things. And I'll tell you as the owner of a, of a health platform that 
I, I don't understand why. Of course, I'm biased in my own favor talking about my own business, but I don't understand why nutrigenomic markers like the ATP binding cassette pathways, cholesterol absorption, hypersynthetic response to uh, saturated fat with APOE carriers, um, LDL receptor, PCSK9, APOC3. A lot of these markers are super allopathic, but for whatever reason, nutrigenomics gets lumped into this alternative medicine place. And so Google has been left and right softly deplatforming these types of sites uh, as outside of the medical consensus. Um, and uh, with very significant drops in organic web traffic to, to, to certain types of sites. Um, and, and there's a double-edged sword there because I do get it on one hand is you don't want to put, you don't want to put bad information in people's hands, but at the same time, you're also, you're also foreclosing the possibility of innovative, of innovative thinking in the space um, because the space has not been totally, totally decided. But um, but, but you as the consumer, we as the consumer, we as the people that are struggling to find our own blueprint have to be very, very careful about the people that are out there just un, just with zero self, self-doubt, zero, zero nuance, just beating you over the head with these mechanisms as if they have solved for every variable in every person. And there's a lot of that out there. And that's, why, that's part of the reason why people become afraid of their food because they are terrified of oxalates and they are terrified of phytic acid and they are terrified of, you know, lectin and histamine and um, casein and, you know, and glyphosate and whatever else. And it's not to say that they shouldn't be because in some cases those things hit the mark, but you got to ask yourself when, if you're sitting out there right now and you're a little bit afraid of your food, you have no idea what to eat and you're struggling be careful about who you let in your ear. There's a, there, there's a, there's a valuable, there's, there's value from hearing people's stories. There's very good commentators that are out there, right? There's also the tyranny of the nutrition influencer. And the tyranny of the nutrition influencer is going gonna, is gonna to basically look like this. It's going to look like person X had a health problem. Again, as I said at the out, outset of this show, so many of us who get into the space, we start with, health issues of our own. And then we figure out a system that works for us. But the problem is, is once we figure out the system that works for us, it, 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 it turns very rapidly and very often into a tyranny because the individual is, believes so deeply in what solved their issue that they can't divorce themselves from the fact that, that there's different metabolic processes that are going on in different people. And the, and, and the thing that solved their issue might not be the thing that solves your issue. In fact, the thing that solved their issue might be the thing that makes your issue a lot worse and makes you really sick. So, so there's a tyranny of nutrition influencers that you have to be wary of. And at Gene Food, we believe that we can't, we have to fill these diagnostic holes, right? I mean, part of this is intuition. Part of this is being careful who you let into your brain and who you listen to because they could be making you ill. And part of it is having systems that are in place for dividing people into different camps in terms of their health. And, um, and look, you can say what you will about nutrigenomics. There's been a, a dearth of studies. There's been hardly any nutrigenomic studies that have been done. I mean, there's the, there's the, um, the Tim Spector study, uh, at King's College London, and, and some Harvard researchers were on um, the PREDICT study. Uh, we talked about, we have on our science page, you know, you can attribute 50% of the post uh, prandial glycemic response to, to genetics, which is significant. But, you know, there's been a lot of single SNP studies done. There has not been a lot of genetic risk scoring. And what we're trying to do here is we have an algorithm and it's not a perfect algorithm. And I don't want to put dogma behind the algorithm and say that this algorithm, you know, look, it's a damn good algorithm though. And it can give you a foundational start, but we need more algorithms. We need more systems for telling people why and when they're not feeling well, as opposed to just, oh, well, you're a human, so therefore, here's why you're not feeling well, because you ate a piece of lettuce and you ate a bean, and didn't you know that those uh, plant species, since they can't run away from uh, their predators, they have these, uh, these, these built-in defense mechanisms, and that's the cause of every illness. It's the, it could be the cause of illness in some cases, but be very careful about getting into a Fort Michelin Mackinac situation where you're terrified of crossing the Mackinac Straits 
because of the cannons that are trained on those waters, even though they haven't fired in 200 years, right? And so what this looked like for me was, um, for me, one of the biggest issues that I have found that is helpful uh, is just simply my physical location. Now, I've had Eric Johnson on, who's the founder of the Locations Effect movement in the past. Um, very interesting story. And some of you who listen regularly to the podcast may have heard that, may have heard that story. Um, under the, under the, under the, 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 the principle of not throwing people off on wild goose chases and, and terrifying people of, of food or of their homes, I certainly think it needs to be taken with multiple grains of salt, right? Because location is not going to be an issue for everybody. Um, for me, you know, the time that I was the most terrified of food of just, just absolutely just working like a maniac to try to get to the bottom of why I felt so terrible in Austin, Texas. Um, and I, I was, uh, we have a gene food diet type that's called the Wyoan diet type. And it's named after, uh, my friend Wyo who runs Casa de Luz in Austin, which is a beautiful macrobiotic restaurant. They serve a, a communal macrobiotic meal three, three times a day. If you're ever in Austin, I'd highly recommend going. But, um, you know, I was going and eating just nothing exclusively, exclusively macro, macrobiotic eating. A lot of people use macrobiotic diets as a healing tool. Um, it's, a, it's meant as almost sort of like a medicinal rebalancing of, um, of the body. And so I just was eating macrobiotic every day. You know, I'm already a skinny guy, lost a ton of weight. I mean, just a ton of weight. I, I, I looked terrible. And I'm just thinking, okay, well, if I just, you know, if I just eat more macrobiotic meals and I, oh, it must have been that egg I had or it must have been that piece of cheese I had or it must have been this or it must have been that. And, um, and I became terrified of food, you know, and I was on the train that if you're listening right now, I, was, I, know, I know how you feel. I know where you're sitting. I know what it's like to feel the way you feel. And um, it, it, this for me has always existed on a spectrum. So, you know, I can get out of balance and, um, and I would speculate uh, that the reason why I would fall out of balance is because of, um, you know, again, with humility to the mechanism, with, with, with humility to the mechanism, because I don't know exactly why. It's a concert of factors. It's a symphony of mechanisms. But, you know, a lot of antibi some antibiotic use as a kid for ear infections um, and, uh, in some unrecognized histamine and, and allergy type things that are normally, you know, that are normally fine, um, can veer a little bit to the anxiety side of the spectrum, you know, can get out of balance in that way and always have been, been that way, feeling a sense of heightened stress, um, around certain events, feeling a sense of heightened intensity around certain events and, uh, exacerbated all by the, 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 the imbalance of this kind of mast cell histamine issue. Um, living in New York City, drinking a lot, working in startups, being stressed out, a lot of red wine, just eating out all the time. For those of you who lived in New York, I mean, if, if there ever was a drinking city, it's New York City. And it's all social, it's dating, it's going out with friends, but it adds up, you know. And I noticed that I would start to get, anytime I would get a bug bite, it would swell up like crazy. And so I'd get a mosquito bite. I'd be at a friend's wedding, I'd get a mosquito bite, I'd wake up the next morning and for days after, it would just be, it would just be going. I mean, it would swell up like a golf ball on the side of my temple, you know? Um, and I come to Austin and it all kind of culminates into this just total, you know, I just felt like I was living in a fog. Austin is literally one of my favorite cities. Um, I own a home there. I, w I wish I could live in that home uh, in East Austin. I can't, there's no way. It's an environment I can't, I just do, do terribly in. And so, and I know, I noticed it looking back, it was an insanity to live there. I noticed it within, you know, 48 hours of getting there, I'll start to feel some of these, these symptoms that I would feel like I'll have, uh, my tailbone will hurt just out of nowhere, you know, as far as I can tell entirely based on this inflammatory reaction that I'm having to what's in the air in Austin. You know, I, I, so I have this, this sort of disrupted microbiome. You're taking antibiotics you know, I would guess based on our scoring uh, that I, I've never had my serum diamine oxidase levels tested, but diamine oxidase is, a, uh, is the enzyme that breaks down extracellular histamine. So my understanding is you have diamine oxidase that's sweeping out histamine in the gut, and then you have um, 
histamine and methyl transferase HNMT that's breaking down in, intracellular histamine. Um, but if you've taken a whole ton of antibiotics, that's going to change the shape of your microbiome. We know that unequivocally. And my, antibiotics will also degrade your body's ability to produce diamine oxidase. So you're kind of throwing off this system where you have this stress, mast cell degranulation, some kind of cytokine reactivity to the, to the actual ambient air. Um, and you have the perfect storm. You get to a place like Austin. I had allergy tests done. My allergy tests were like, you know, like Jonathan grass, these native grasses in Austin. I was just off the charts allergic to these things. And so I get there and I, and I, and I start hyper-focusing on food. And at the end of the day, the single biggest thing that I could do rather than being terrified of eating that next morsel of food was to stop taking antibiotics. Now, let me say, if you have to take antibiotics because you have an infection, then of course you're going to take antibiotics. But I was taking antibiotics on an unhealthy loop. I was taking antibiotics to stop these bug bites that were getting out of control, which is what I need to be doing is taking, you know, a ton of antihistamines, quercetin, and just stop drinking red wine. Um, but nobody really knew that. So it's just on a loop years, like happened four or five times. And, and then you're getting in an environment where, you know, you're in an inflammatory state because you're sitting in Austin, Texas, where you're just not physiologically suited. And, and, you know, if you think it's just me that's saying this, there's actually a Nietzsche quote, um, from a book that he wrote, um, I'll include in the show notes and I'll include, I'll include the exact quote in the show notes as well. But a friend told me, um, this uh, turned me on to this quote. And he essentially lamented later in his life that he had been living in environments where that he was not physiologically suited to. And his theory was that a man or a woman could not find their true purpose in life unless they were aligned location, aligned by living in a location that would bring out the best in them. So his theory is that you could have a lion of a man or a woman and you could put him or her in a environment that they were not physiologically suited to and it would literally it would literally just stop them from blooming as they were intended to bloom that's this is Nietzsche okay um and I'm just putting some scientific theory to to why that could be the case I mean he lamented living in certain parts of Germany because he just said that he was literally not suited to living there and he never should have been living there and I'm a firm believer that in some cases not in all cases that your physical location can be the biggest determining factor and for me, it was. And um, just simply removing myself from Austin. And I mean, just even going from Austin to New York City, which is hilarious because New York City is a insane, not very healthy place. But I would feel tremendously better just going to New York City. Getting out of Austin, for me, was the thing that got me feeling better, you know, and also stopping taking antibiotics. It's been years since I've taken antibiotics. I used to take also just a, a, a topical clindamycin for uh, acne if I had a zit. My, uh, my cousin's a, a doctor and he gave, gave us this stuff because it's great if you have a blemish. But, um, and I don't get a ton of acne, but uh, would take it here and there. And I, I stopped doing that as well. This is clindamycin is a very nasty antibiotic. It's broad spectrum antibiotic. And I'm not sure that you can say that taking it topically would do a whole hell of a lot. But, you know, the people that take many rounds of clindamycin are um, often the ones that get this uh, C. diff uh, explosion and they have to do fecal transplants, um, which, is, which is pretty crazy. And ironically, I had a physician, a physician in Austin who just, a functional doctor who just had no idea what he was doing. And one time put me on a course of, of after I had one of these bug bites, put me on a course of clindamycin for like 20 days or something like that. Just, just on a hunch. You know, just on a hunch, just here, take clindamycin for 20 days. So, so getting past that antibiotic use, understanding that red wine is a, is a thing that's not really great for my system. Um, understanding that uh, super high histamine foods um, are not a great look always either. But mainly just getting out of that environment was the thing for me. It wasn't you know, as much as I wanted to tie it to food or a supplement or something that I could do, um, because nobody would let me have that insight. You know, I'm sure there's people listening to this right now that think this guy's absolutely out of his mind, you know, and, and, you know, maybe I am some days I definitely am. Um, but I'm not out of my mind on this. I don't think that it's a controversial point that your ambient, that the ambient air can, can elicit cytokine activity. 
I, I don't think that that's a controversial point. I mean, the ambient air, just pollen can, can cause the degranulation of mast cells. It can cause an immune response. And, um, you know, and I believe that looks like interleukin-6, that looks like histamine, that looks like, you know, uh, any, just mast cells just letting go and saying, we don't like what we're experiencing here. Um, and so getting out of that environment, that was my thing. It wasn't eating nothing but meat for like six straight months, you know, or whatever the case. Although maybe that is your thing. I don't know. I, I'm going to do an episode next on the carnivore diet. I, I, I'm thinking it's unlikely that's your thing. It could be your thing. The whole point of this episode is, is that if you're afraid of food, you're not alone. We've been there. You know, I've been there. And there's imperfect science, but there are tools you can use to start to get a window into why you're feeling the way you're feeling. And for me, my, me and apparently Nietzsche, our location has a huge impact on our physical health. It's probably the number one most important thing that I could, that I could look to. There are some food interventions and some things as well, um, for sure. But f- physical location is a huge determining factor. That's my thing. I'm not saying that's your thing. I'm not saying that's most people's things. I'm not saying that's a majority of things. I'm not saying that there's scientific proof that that affects some significant number of people. What I am saying is that you don't, don't be careful about the nutrition influencers that you listen to. Check yourself, ask yourself, are you under the tyranny of a nutrition influencer right now? Are you living somebody else's regimen? Are you living somebody else's diet? Are you doing what somebody else worked for somebody else and, and, and you're getting pressure, you know, marketing pressure to follow their diet. Is that your diet? Is that what's best for you? You know, I found my thing. And, and oh, by the way, it's not like I banished my humanity by finding that thing. It's not like I wake up under perfect health every single day because I found that thing. It's not what this is about. This isn't about, you know, not being human. You're going to be human. You're going to have bad days. You're not going to feel well on certain days. You know, the, I love the people who are like, I went vegan and I, so I never get sick. I never get sick because I went vegan. It's like, okay, great. If that's you, great. But, um, but, but I feel pretty good and I'm pretty health, uh, pretty healthy and, you know, and I'm doing okay. And, uh, but I, what I want to, I want, what I want to empower people listening to do is if you're afraid of that next bite of food and you have no idea what to eat and you're experiencing some kind of a chronic condition, let's do the work together to figure out why you feel that way not why the next person feel that way you know etc and so now I'm, i think i'm i think i've beaten that that point home so that is the halloween episode of uh of gene food if you're afraid of your food um there are systems in place you can you can get past it i wish you luck on your journey and i thank you very much for listening The Gene Food Podcast is our attempt to synthesize the latest developments in the fields of genetics, nutrition, and medicine, and offer you practical tips and stories you can use in your own unique health journey. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find more information online at mygenefood.com.